Hi, there are five types of OS to cover, the first of which is the multitasking OS. This really covers most normal computers. This OS supports multiple programs being run at the same time. You are thinking about things like Windows or Mac OS because you're able to have many programs open and running at the same time. You might be using Google Chrome. You might be listening to Spotify at the same time. They're running either in parallel or they're being run concurrently. So behind the scenes, the OS will either be utilizing the multiple cores a CPU might have to split up these programs across each core, in which case they are able to run literally in parallel. However, if you've only got one core in your CPU, or perhaps more likely you've got more programs open and you've got cores available, the OS has to be a little bit cleverer and use concurrent processing. So we have these overlapping time periods. In this case, the OS will rapidly switch the CPU between executing each program. If each program has a tiny amount, possibly using a scheduling algorithm like round robin. So each program might get a few clock cycles or microseconds on the CPU and it rapidly switches between these different programs. And because the user can't operate at this speed, we're much, much slower than a CPU. We don't notice the fact that they are switching. And so it gives the impression to the user of these programs being executed in parallel. The next type of OS to look at is an embedded OS. Some of these types do overlap. So you could be both multitasking and embedded, but to be honest, embedded systems tend to not have multitasking. So what is an embedded system? An embedded system is the computer which an embedded OS runs on. An embedded system is a computer that can only perform a limited range of functions. And this computer is surrounded by a larger system. So a classic example of this is a washing machine. The washing machine itself is not a computer. It's this larger system we're talking about. Inside the washing machine will be a little computer called the embedded system, which can only perform a limited range of functions. This little computer is very specialized for washing clothes. You can't play a game on this computer. You can't go on social media on this computer. It's only performing a very limited range of functions. Other good examples to use if you had to give some were examples within a car. A car has got loads of embedded systems. An ATM is an embedded system, as are any smart devices like smart TVs. Now, all of those won't have a normal operating system. They tend to have two key properties, these embedded operating systems. They tend to have a limited range of possible functions, which is what gives the embedded system a limited range of functions. They only can do a few particular tasks, nothing too fancy. And also, they tend to be read-only. That means the user isn't able to interact with it and save anything. And that's often because the hardware uses a lot of ROM, a lot more ROM than a normal computer would. In fact, in many embedded systems, the OS may be held in ROM as opposed to secondary storage. The reason it would do this is because it's cheaper just to have ROM. If you don't need to save anything, then you don't need to use secondary storage. You can get away with just having ROM. Embedded OSs are often real-time OSs, but not always. A real-time OS will handle inputs in a guaranteed response time. That response time is meant to be minimal. We're meant to try and cut down on this. So there is no or very little waiting involved. And this definitely isn't what a normal operating system is. Windows is not real time. If you click a button or press a key on your keyboard, it often responds quite quickly, but it can wait. You have to wait for it quite often. And this is not what most OSs are. Most OSs are not real time. Windows is pretty snappy and pretty responsive most of the time, but all of us have sat waiting for stuff to load. All of us have clicked a button and nothing's happened for a few seconds. That's a sign that the OS is doing something more important. It's sort of letting our input sit there waiting. Whereas a real-time OS for second, you as a user interact with it, or it reads some data from a sensor, it will respond straight away. So these are used in safety critical tasks, including in healthcare, maybe intensive care units where these computers have to read measurements and then respond immediately, alerting doctors or maybe giving some medicine. It can't afford to wait a few seconds while it's doing something else. Often these real-time OSs are very simple to enable this to happen. If nothing else is really running, then it can respond straight away. For example, a pacemaker hasn't got any additional software running. It's just purely checking the heartbeat. If there's an issue, it needs to respond immediately. So that's partly why it can be so quick to respond. But in other systems, the OS will be quite complicated, say the autopilot in a plane. That's quite a complicated system. However, still, there'll be certain inputs which trigger an immediate response. So certain interrupts which can occur to stop it straight away. Some buttons might not be super important to deal with straight away, but some might be 
safety critical and so it has to respond without any weight. The type of OS which students often get wrong is the multi-user OS. And they often think it was wrong because it's quite an obvious sounding definition here. Multi-user OSs can be used by multiple users at the same time. However, people don't always pay attention to that last bit of the definition and students often think that this covers stuff like Windows, a normal OS, because you can sign in with different user accounts. However, normal OSs like Windows are not multi-user because you can't sign in and use the computer at the same time. So for multi-user OSs, we're thinking about servers, we're thinking about the fact that there could be multiple terminals in the server room where users can log on and access the server at the same time. You also might do this remotely through the internet, say. So these OSs are quite complicated because they need to somehow balance the CPU's time between the users. How fairly it does this will depend on maybe how important the user is. It would also need to prevent conflicts between the user's actions. We will look at this later in the course in relation to stuff like record locking. We want to try and avoid issues where users access the same file at the same time. That can cause issues. And for security, we don't want users accessing each other's data. Ultimately, all of their data will be held in RAM while they're using it. And we don't want them to somehow unintentionally access each other's stuff. That'd be a security risk. Another type of OS where you need to have servers in your mind are distributed operating systems. These are designed to run the same program across multiple different computers. So they're distributed across these different servers. And often we need these systems when I've got massive processing or storage requirements, which a single computer isn't able to handle. Again, it's quite a complicated OS because it has to somehow split up the program, distribute it to each individual computer. It needs to remain in contact with these computers. And then once they're done, it needs to somehow combine these results. So very difficult to do. But these are used for things like cloud computing, AWS, Microsoft Azure, stuff like that. Analytics on very large data sets and also scientific computing, where it'd be far too computationally expensive to do it on one computer. But when you split it across multiple, maybe thousands, it becomes a lot more realistic to achieve. 